Welcome to STEMiverse Podcast, episode 33. In this episode, Peter and Marcus talk with Tim Mendham. Tim is a freelance journalist, editor, and executive officer for Australian Skeptics INC. In 2000, he was joint winner of the Australian Business Publishers Bell Award for Best Analytical Writing of the Year. In 2006, Fast Thinking was named Best B2B Publication in the same awards. He has written extensively on IT, technology, R&D, business finance, management and marketing issues. During his career, he has edited a number of publications including Lab News, a technical journal for the R&D community, CFO, the then premier professional magazine for senior finance executives, Fast Thinking, a quarterly publication devoted to innovation issues, and most recently, CIO, Australia's leading magazine for senior IT management. In this interview, Team talks about skepticism, critical thinking, and how we can help our students and children develop life skills that will help them navigate their way through a confusing and often deceiving world. This is STEMiverse Podcast Episode 33. STEMiverse is a podcast produced by Tech Explorations. Our mission is to help educators become awesome at teaching STEM, be it at home or in the classroom. Whether you are a professional or casual teacher teaching in a classroom or a parent or caretaker teaching at home, this podcast brings you the knowledge and experiences of practitioners, academics, entrepreneurs, and lifelong learners who are passionate about education and strive every day to make the teaching and learning of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and art better. This podcast is brought to you by Tech Explorations, a leading provider of educational resources for makers, STEM students, and teachers. For a limited time only, go to texplore.com slash STEMiverse and receive Peter's latest ebook, Maker Education Revolution, a book about how making is changing the way that people learn and teach in the 21st century. Hey, Marcus, we're back. Yes, yes, we are. And who do we have this week? Uh, it's a special person this time. It's the uh, editor of Skeptic Magazine. And uh, full disclosure, I've been reading Skeptic's Magazine for maybe two, three years now, Tim, I think. I can't really clearly remember. Uh, but I've been a skeptic for since I remember myself. And uh, Tim is going to explain what that really means. <laughs> Give us a definition of the term. So, hi, Tim. Thank you for being on our show. It's great to have you here. Have my pleasure. Uh, would you be able to take a few minutes and tell us about yourself? Okay. Um, I'm basically a journalist, freelance journalist. I've been a member of the Skeptics ever since it started, which is almost embarrassing to say it was 38 years ago. 38 years. Wow. Years ago. So it started in 1980, 81. So obviously, I was very young at the time. Young and naive, but never mind. And I've been involved in the committee ever since. Um, it's initially started, well, for me personally, it was, uh, I was a science journalist, so it fitted in very well with what I was doing as a career. Hmm. Uh, before my journalism career, I was a high school teacher teaching English and history, uh, or as we called it at the time, anguish and hysteria. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of fun. Yes. Um, but actually, those two areas were um, pretty good areas to uh, think about critical thinking because they're both two subjects in which you analyse data or supposed data, so uh, it fitted in very, very well. So I probably had that inclination, plus the journalism, it's supposedly uh, critical thinkers, not always, but that's that's also a good uh, foundation. Well, so yeah, I'm, we're going to touch on a lot of those issues, especially why you think that English and uh, history are very, a very good place to do some critical thinking. I'd like to get into that. Uh, could you tell us what is critical thinking? Critical thinking is actually something that we all do all the time. Um, it, people might be surprised at that, but basically critical thinking is looking at uh, what a claim is, what the evidence is, what a presentation is about, what someone or something is saying, and then you have a look at it closely, you dissect it, you, you take it apart, you look at the way it's presented, you look at the content, you look at the person who's presenting it, and then you build up an assessment of what sort of validity there is to what they're saying or what the claim is. Now, you put it in sort of everyday terms, as I said, it happens 
to us all the time, often without even thinking about it. You're going off to work or to school or whatever, and you might decide which way, how should I get there? And do I take the train? Do I walk? Do I drive in a car? Do I, whatever I do, you make a decision based on a whole range of parameters from what's it going to cost me, how long is it going to take, what's the most comfort, is it reliable, all those sort of things, what's the weather like, and you sort of weigh all those things up very, very quickly in your head, and you, as I say, you do this all the time, and you make a decision. So based on the parameters, the inputs, you then sort of take the options and you look at them and make a decision. You do the same thing with buying a fridge or buying a car, and uh, the idea there is to try and be a bit dispassionate about it, to try and sort of look at it sort of without getting emotional uh, attachments, although when you're buying a car, you've probably got a lot of those. Oh, I prefer red, blue, uh, that sort of thing. Um, but you, you'd look at the, the options, the prices, the, the supplier, the how long it might last for a car, what, what, it's, what its engine is like, what its petrol usage or electricity usage is like, all those things. You take a proposal that's put to you, and you take it apart and you apply critical, as in not criticising, but it's actually sort of assessing something from the elements that are there. You use your brain, which is the thinking part, and you then come to a decision based on that. And the sceptics use exactly that same technique. It's exactly the same stuff as uh, everybody uses every day. And it's, it's not something you should be scared of or uh, that sounds weird. It's very normal. That, and the sceptics apply that to a specific area which is basically what we call the, uh, the um, pseudoscience of the paranormal. Hmm. Paranormal is pretty straightforward. That's all, all the fun stuff, right? That's all the <laughs> flying sources, yeah. flying sources and the Loch Ness monsters and the, the Bigfoot and all those sort of areas. And people who, do, who can move things with, it, with their mind, all sorts of different areas there. The pseudoscience is something which pretends to be scientific, but from what we currently understand of how the world works, they are not... They are, going outside the parameters of, of a, a usual understanding. If you say you can sort of uh, bend a, a bit of metal without touching it just with your mind, we don't normally, we, we can't normally do that ourselves. That's a bit of the paranormal. But it's also if you say you can cure someone with a particular product and they say, well, that's never been proven or it's been disproven, that's where you get into the pseudoscience area. Hmm. And the stuff that sceptics do ranges from the fun stuff, and I really mean it's fun. Um, investigating flying sources and things, it's not particularly harmful to anybody, to the other end of the scale where it gets very, very serious, where you're talking about people's health and living their lives. Hmm. As a society, are we more, uh, do we do more critical thinking or less critical thinking? Uh, <laughs> wow. Well, I, I, I think that's a simple question. <laughs> I think with modern yeah, no, technology, thanks. we maybe are doing more critical thinking, but then as a populace as a whole, we've got five minutes <laughs> going down. <laughs> or less, yeah. 64 words or less. Yeah. Um, because of the technology, uh, misinformation is obviously spreading very widely, very quickly mm -hmm. to a big audience. Once upon a time, if you made a claim to reach one person or a few people, if you did it in a newspaper, a few thousand people, now you can put it on the net, and therefore it, it um, goes widely. And, the, and as everyone says, you know, if, you, if you're using Dr. Google or whatever, people, for some reason, I believe a lot of what they read on the net or they hear through social media or whatever. Um, are people more critical? From some areas they are, but one of the classic areas, obviously, of, of paranormal claims is with religion. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the younger people are generally turning, depends on where you are, I suppose. A lot of places of the world, Europe, Australia, whatever, at the well, number of people believing in religions of any sort is sort of dropping down. People who say they have no religion. Not quite sure that's the same in America, which is highly religious society. So from that point of view, we probably are getting more critical thinking. Uh, we're certainly perhaps becoming a bit more cynical. That's not necessarily sceptical or critical thinking. A cynic is someone said, no, rubbish, it doesn't work, without looking at something closely, without looking at the evidence. Overall, I would like to think people are getting more critical thinking. It's certainly something that people, uh, that we're hoping that they would teach in schools and universities where it would be very, very valuable. Overall... I really can't say. I'd really... It's hard to answer you. I think my wishes would be greater than the, the actuality. I just wanted to go back to your example of purchasing a car earlier as an example of you know a place where critical thinking uh, would be well used. And, uh, yeah, like from a personal experience, I do all that research in the beginning. I think a lot of people operate like that. And then you go to the showroom, you do a desk drive, and it doesn't matter 
or the, the, what the research was. <laughs> <laughs> you just buy the car that felt good when you drove it, the test drive. And it's the same thing in a lot of different areas, both in the marketplace and out, and out of the marketplace. So is there some kind of method that skeptics have developed perhaps or like a, a strong, somebody with a strong skeptical background uh, could apply in everyday situations like that, especially high stakes situations like not just should I go left or right when you're trying to figure out how to get to a particular place, but you know, you got to do a big investment or you've got to decide which career to follow, things of that sort, high stakes. Peter wants to be a Vulcan. Yes, that well. Yes, but you said no emotion, so that's what I that's what went to came to my mind immediately. Uh, spoke. So, are you talking about particular skeptical methodology? Yeah, I mean, sort of. If, I mean, it's skeptical skeptics. Okay, whether they're a capital skeptic or a low A skeptic or whatever, um, are as human as anybody. Right? We're all we're all faulted. We all make mistakes. We all have emotions, and some stages, sometimes your emotions might overpower your your logic. The issue with it is it depends on where it is. Honestly, buying a car, most cars will run fine. They work when you take them out of a when a new car, you take it out of a car yard. Secondhand car, perhaps not quite as much. The decision as to how much you're influenced by emotion there, mm-hmm. with by yeah, comfort or the level. Salesperson. Yeah, if because you're not a salesperson, <laughs> yeah, how can we, well that that's a good salesperson can overcome your logic. Yeah, um, your, your restraint. It's not as earth-shattering if you which way you tend to go. I mean, you're not going to, you know. Do you get into the health areas, the mm. serious areas, the critical thinking, and as opposed to emotion and good salesmanship becomes a very serious issue. It's, it's, it can be, uh, can be a fatal issue. There's so many stories for that. Yes, I mean, if you go in the car yard, I, I bought a car because I like the look of it, and you figure it's a reasonable, it's a known brand, it's a reasonable car, it's a like color. Yeah. If you think of it the other way, uh, that, okay, a single decision, perhaps if you put a little bit of emotion in there, it won't ruin everything, won't ruin your life. But what if you take the aggregate of multiple decisions in which you take the decision not so much with a skeptical mind, but more of an emotional, uncalculated mind? Is that then a problem over the span of several decades? It, 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 it is a problem, yeah. I mean, it's, it's obviously, yeah, it depends on the person and sort of the areas they apply their emotional response rather than a, a logic response. And if they do that everywhere, without any consideration of, of the implications, of the, the prospects of any sort of upside or downside, and just do it because they want to do it, a purely emotion-driven response, that can be very dangerous to them personally and obviously to other people as well. Mm. Um, but I would suggest that there would be very few people who would act that way all the time. It would be a sort of a, mm. a fairly sort of a neurotic or psychotic sort of thing. I actually do know some. It's all the So You do it all the time. Yeah. You do it all the time. But sort of we yeah. Are, yeah. Uh, don't let them make no a decision. decision. I mean, it, it's a like the thing now, do I step onto the road now or not? Yeah. when I'm walking. Mm. You tend to make a decision if you just say, I'm not going to look. Perhaps they've got a headset on. Mm. But I'm not going to look. I'm just going to walk out onto the road whenever I feel like it. Evolution would say you're not going to last very long. Yeah. Yeah. And you end up winning a, a Darwin Prize or something for, uh, for you know, <laughs> making a wrong decision. People do that all the time. Now you've got to explain what is a Darwin Award? <laughs> the Darwin Award is, is for, for dumb decisions, basically. Uh, dumb choices and basically... If you lived your life that way, you would soon well, you, you wouldn't last very long. So you'd be taken out of the gene pool. So somebody that your has contribution been, to the gene pool by not being in it. <laughs> so somebody who has been awarded the uh, the Darwin Award means that he's out of, out of the gene pool. Well, that's, well yes, yeah, so that's true. They, they, they normally have sort of um, moved on to the next stage of their, <laughs> of their life. I've seen Darwin Awards where the accident has caused the death of the, the children. Oh, jeez. And they'll spring. And so that was another way to take the gene pool out of action. <laughs> That's when, you I mean, sort of, if you talk to skeptics um, about what are the areas that distress them the most, it tends to be that area, especially of health areas, health decisions, yeah. and when they affect other people, and especially when they affect kids. I mean, it, it, uh, if you want to bring tears to a skeptic's eyes, you talk about um, children being used and abused in a medical sense, honestly. Well, uh, well. Speaking of of children, and since we are an education podcast, 
and actually focusing on STEM, what can we do in order to help uh, raise more skeptical people? Because the way I understand it, that, that is a net positive for society to increase the number of skeptically trained people, right? Not people with closed minds, but people that can examine the facts, you know, can understand the difference between hey, say and evidence and things of that sort. What would you suggest? Well, skepticism is, you know, the, the, the punchline for skepticism is scientific investigation hmm. of claims of pseudoscience and the paranormal. The emphasis put on that scientific investigation, skepticism works exactly as skepticism is. It works the same way as science does, right? Through investigation, through assessment, it's not necessarily going to find a truth because that's a, that's a very dodgy concept anyway, especially in scientific terms. Um, it's not in pseudoscientific terms, but it is in science terms. But what you're doing with science, uh, what you should be doing with science, is what you should be doing with virtually every area of subjects you teach and learn at school or university or whatever, is how to think. Yeah. Right? It's not what to think. It's it's how to think. And that, that, that approach is a scientific approach. Basically, I mean, science is not, should not be a, a jar full of facts. Right? Science should be a way to make the job, <laughs> a way to find out, to investigate facts. It's a process, and that's what skepticism is too. It's a process. If you can tell someone, this is sort of like being able to teach a, uh, give a man some food and he'll eat for a week, tell him how to fish and he'll you know, eat forever. It's the same way. It's, it's the process of teaching a method rather than teaching a bunch of facts. Now, when I was doing my teacher's training, etc., there was an expression called uh, mug jug, I don't know if it's still used, but it's basically the, um, the image is that a teacher is a, a mug full of information, no, a jug full of information, and pouring facts into the mug, which is the student. Mm. So this is what you have to know for the exam, right? It's just a, like a list of bullet points of facts, etc., that you just regurgitate. And that was true of every subject. It, it wasn't just true of, sort of STEM subjects, it was true of the, the arts and all sorts of areas as well. We, we were actually, when I was doing my training and, and teaching, we were trying to fight against that. We were saying it's not this idea of a, um, a teacher as a, a despot in a classroom uh, telling you this is the way it is. It's trying to teach people how to learn, how to apply critical thinking to whatever area they want. And once they've learned the method, they can then apply it everywhere. And the method is pretty simple. It's basically show me. <laughs> That's it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, I use the example in skeptical circles of um, trying to explain to them, you know, what does a skeptic do? And basically, if I say I can fly, your response would be, show me, right? A very normal, yeah. very natural, very reasonable, and reasonable in every sense of the word, thing to do. Um, and then you work out how to actually test someone to see if they can fly or not. Um, if someone said, and your friend might do this, the one who's emotionally driven, and I've had someone do this as well, so perhaps I know someone like you, maybe we know the same person. When I told that uh, example to them, their response was, that's amazing. Hmm. So I say, I can fly, and their response was, that's amazing. And I said, well, now I can sell you a bridge. Because <laughs> you're, yeah. you, you're using absolutely no critical thinking whatsoever, and I, perhaps your friend would say the same thing. You know, they wouldn't ask, well, hang on, that doesn't sound likely. You know, tell me more, explain what your claim is, show me you can do it, etc. Now, whether you're doing science at schools, university, you are sort of someone puts forward a suggestion, a theory, a hypothesis, a uh, assessment, say an English test, text, and you then look at that dispassionately and say, does this work, <laughs> this fly, in other words. And then if you can teach that method to people, that Skeptical method, critical thinking method, scientific method, whatever you want to call it, you can apply that everywhere. And when the people are already doing it, obviously, they don't do it in their lives all the time. They just don't think that that's what they're doing. Uh, it doesn't have that name, you know. It's called making a decision. Yeah. So I suppose in our world that is is becoming very complicated. Like I'm just looking at the simple electricity bill now compared to 20 years ago. It's a little mm. more complicated, right? Yeah, <laughs> um, and more expensive. And more expensive. When I look at you know, buying a new computer or um, just buying tickets to fly to an overseas destination, <laughs> just the amount of complexity that you have to deal with in order to make one simple decision uh, is a lot more than what it used to be in the past. So do you think that 
being a skeptic is a core skill to surviving present and future situations. I think that's true. I think it's very true. And so when uh, the skeptic first started, life was a lot simpler. Uh, your inputs were very sort of minimal. You certainly didn't have the social media. You didn't have the internet, quite frankly, uh, when that was around. So the things you gathered were from TV or radio or from the print. And they were limited by how much information they could give you because of the size of the medium, the amount of content they could uh, have. What uh, is now, of course, is that with social media and the internet and all the multitude of uh, TV and radio and uh, streaming or whatever um, inputs you need, it is very complicated. Not just the technology itself, which can do a lot more and is a lot more um, complex, but also the content. And you're seeing so much different content all at the same time. Um, Perhaps if you're younger, like my teenage son, he's grown up with it and he can sort of absorb different um, inputs from 35 different uh, sources all at the same time. I, I, I can't, because I can't, because I haven't grown up with that. So, I mean, <laughs> but I do as best. But the thing is, it's not just the amount of um, content, but also the complexity of the technology. And what's the interesting thing is that's a, very much a two-edged sword, whereas it's more complicated, we have a lot more power and ability than we ever had before. When your encyclopedia was a set of volumes on the bookshelf, you could try and say, gee, I want to know what the capital of Venezuela is. And I'd have to go to the encyclopedia and find Venezuela down there and look it up, right? And now I can do that through Wikipedia or whatever, Hmm. through online sources and resources, and I can get information at my feet that I would never have had before, certainly not at the speed that I can get it and the amount that I can get it now. So we are not just uh, being attacked and assaulted by a a difficult uh, amount of technology and content. We are also empowered to actually do investigations that we could never have done before. The question you have to then apply, your critical thinking is, how good is that information you're now getting compared to how good it was before? Now, just because it was around at a simpler time doesn't mean the information back then was more accurate or more reliable. You probably couldn't tell. (laughs) You wouldn't know because you didn't have that many sources to compare. Now you do, yeah. and if you if you, if you you take rather than just take your your friend's response and my friend's response, and take the first response you get, the first bit of information you get, the, the top score on Google, you can at least look down at the second page and get a variety of, of uh, angles on a, on a one bit of information. So I think it, it, so now the complex world is actually a, it's a bad thing because it's hard to cope with, and there's a lot of things happening that make life very difficult. Um, there's also a lot of opportunities there at the same time. So it really does work both ways. You talked about investigation. I was wondering, what is something that the society has investigated that you thought was quite improbable but actually turned out to be true? That's an example. Hmm. (laughs) Where do you start? (laughs) Where do you start? Um, Nothing. Nothing so far. So you only take the big cases. (laughs) But no, no, we actually take little cases too. I mean, um, there are always surprising things in science, right? And, you know, Mm -hmm. as... um, you know, pseudoscience becomes science when it's proved to be correct. Yeah. Right? And, uh, and people sort of bring out, you know, age-old examples of things that in, improbable and then uh, they're proved true. Um, you know, people always talk about meteors, meteorites, rocks falling from space were considered a, a, a hoax several hundred years ago. And we know it's true. Mm-hmm. Continental drift would seem like a weird idea in the early part of the 20th century. We now know or believe it's true. Right. There's, uh, there's some pretty major things which did seem improbable that uh, are now true, but you have to put those things under a great deal of pressure to make sure that uh, what you're coming up with is, is a decent result. There's a line used by, I think it was Carl Sagan, who's a known sceptic, mm-hmm. um, who said, people laughed at Galileo, people laughed at Copernicus, People laughed at this letter, but remember, they also laughed at Bozo the Clown. <laughs> yes, mm-hmm. I remember right? that. So just because it sounds improbable and people are criticising it doesn't mean that eventually it'll be true. Because there's a lot of stuff out there which is improbable and will stay that way. For, for, from our point of view, we have done a lot of investigation. We've got a $100,000 challenge in Australia mm-hmm. to anyone who can prove a particular paranormal skill. Right. It's a genuine challenge. It's real money, right? And we basically, someone comes along and I get an application once every week, I would say, mm-hmm. easily. Um, and when people realise they have to do a test <laughs> to prove their, their particular skill, they tend to go away. 
Uh, yeah. They're not going to get the money just by saying so. I'm not as gullible as your friend or my friend. <laughs> okay. So I suppose that's the that's the true spirit of scepticism. Like, uh, is the fact that there is a chance for all these weird claims to be true, but for us to believe them, they need to go under the scientific pressure cooker, which means uh, a number of relatively simple tests. When you come to think of it, the scientific method is relatively straightforward and simple, but uh, the claimant has to operate in a controlled environment where those claims can actually be tested. And uh, that is very confronting for both make claims and when they know that the claims don't really stand to that kind of yeah. pressure. In, in the sceptical world, we have you probably can see a sliding scale between things that are pretty well accepted, the sun is going to rise tomorrow, or the earth is going to travel around the sun, to things at the other end of the scale that are highly improbable, right? Mm -hmm. that, um, that I can bend a bar of metal with my own brain, mm -hmm. right? And things will range up on a sliding scale. And what the sceptics would say was, well, where does this fit? Okay? Now, from some things you can look at and from the first impression, you say, well, it's pretty much down towards the bottom end of unlikely, right? Uh, there are other things to say, well, yeah, it's interesting. It'd be fun to have a look at that. Other things to say, well, this fits in with what we already know. So we say this is highly likely. So you work your way on the, from the improbable to the probable, from the, you hard to say impossible, it's a bit definitive, to possible, and you try and fit, see where everything fits on that scale. Now, we do not say... We have, I'll say it again. We try not to say instantly that that's a load of junk. In reality, you've seen so many claims that are similar over and over and over and over again, the same claim. It's amazing how often they keep coming up from different people. But after a while, you say, this has been tested yes. and yeah. tested and retested, and I can be pretty confident that there ain't nothing there. Now, the skeptics, as, as you say, we look at this $100,000 test. We put people up for a a, a, a actual test, and we work out the test between both parties so that both sides are very happy with the way the test is going, right? I mean, there has, has to be mutual agreement that this is a fair test before we will even proceed. Hmm. If one side feels at that stage, oh, I'm not quite sure about this, this is a part or whatever, we say stop. Yeah. And then we undergo a test, we have an initial test just to see what someone says they can do, just to understand what the, what the uh, situation is, and then we lay down a really tough scientific test and uh, we'll ask them what they think their success rate is, et cetera, and we'll work the test accordingly. And really, a test like that might take five minutes. Yep. If you think, if you get a 20-sided uh, dice and someone says they can pick what number's going to come up when you roll it, first one, you've got a 1 in 20 chance. Second one, you've got a, a 1 in 400 chance. Anyone got a calculator? <laughs> yep. Mm-hmm. You multiply it out until you say you've got a one in a million chance. You might only be having about ten throws of the dice, hmm. right? Um, and therefore, you can do that in five minutes. And you can do it yourself. Everyone can do it themselves. They can test themselves. And that's part of the problem, that people often think they have a skill, um, and but their criteria for testing it are often pretty poor. Those are the best tests. And, and people can do it. And I've done this with people all the time. Now, most of the people who approach us are genuine people, right? I've got no doubt that they firmly that they can do these particular things. There's obviously a few shonks out there, and you hopefully you try to sort of pick them up, pick them as best you can. They're very good shonks. It's very hard to pick. But uh, we, yeah, you try your best, and we say, well, let's put it to the test. Without naming names, what was the best shonk you've seen? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Stories. A shonk. Shonk, uh, yep. They would tend to be psychics. Oh, right, okay. So that's talking the to the dead. psychics or quack cure people. Oh, no, yeah, psychics including people who can talk to dead relatives. Hmm. Okay. Uh, some of them are very good at it. They're the ones in the, in the evolutionary process survive. A bad con man won't last very long, hmm. right, because they're just bad at doing what they do. But there are plenty of people out there who are making good livings, I mean, very good livings, a lot better livings than skeptics make, I can assure you who are making very good livings out of conning people, and I would suggest knowingly conning people. And in the psychic realm, in the talking to the dead, in making predictions, in doing character assessments, all those sort of things, I would say that's where some of the most overt and uh, almost evil shonks exist. The health area, quack cures, um, there's a lot of people out there who are really taking advantage of people. 
I've just been talking to someone today and yesterday about someone who's offering um, some very strange, uh, supposedly scientific process. You mentioned the word quantum and you've basically got yeah, <laughs> science on your yes, side. Word. Uh, it's the most misused term around quantum this, Magnetic quantum crystals. that. <laughs> And uh, that, yeah, those sort of things take in people. People are gullible, they'll take your money off you very mm. easily. But it's a whole new discussion, like when we start talking about quad healers and uh, homeopathy and yeah. needles and energy zones and all that. Yeah. Well, yeah. let's not get into that right now because <laughs> what I wanted to ask you next is uh, just your advice on, say, uh, let's say your son or a young person who wants to know how to effectively detect BS or claims that are highly unlikely to be true. Like for an older person who's had some experience in life and has been thinking about those things for 20 or 30 years, I suppose it gets easier over time. But let's say you're a 15 year old and somebody comes and says that if you drink this concussion, you're going to become double, doubly strong. And that person might be going to the gym, trying really, really hard to, you know, as teenagers do, to become stronger and build up a nice body. And then this person comes and says, oh, you can just do it by drinking this concussion. Uh, how can you detect those types of claims? Two, three trademarks, perhaps, of uh, highly unlikely claims. It's very hard, especially for someone in the ages you're talking about, in their mid-teens, etc., who are starting them. And, yeah, little kids are susceptible to claims that their parents make, uh, you know, believe in Santa Claus, the tooth fairy, whatever. Uh, the poor, sweet little things um, are so trusting <laughs> what their parents say that they'll believe them until later on. Um, you know, my son used to believe in Santa Claus, and I got no problems with that at the time, you know, when he was young. Uh, but he still, he doesn't anymore, so that's probably where his critical thinking Say when kids start thinking, oh, hang on, there's a lot of kids in the world, how could Santa travel around the world, you know, yes. in, in, in one night? That's critical thinking. That's, that's when they start. And they do that pretty early on. They're about, what, five, six, seven years old. They start applying critical thinking in those sort of cases. And that's a pretty, yeah, that's, that's a, Santa Claus flying around the world is a pretty extreme claim to make. Yeah. Right? So uh, that they can start to see that one pretty straightforward, that that's, uh, that's fairly obviously some dodgy claims in there. Because um, it is so extreme, it just doesn't work physically as we know it. Then you start getting into the more um, complex or intricate or clever claims uh, that mislead people. At that stage, I would suggest that what is a good thing to do is start assessing the way it's presented. Right? You see if someone is using particular techniques and skills. Now, you can do this by taking apart advertising. Right, say television advertising or print advertising, whatever you want to use, and you see how is it presented. Uh, I've taught this, of course. I taught this in English classes. We started off doing filmmaking classes and that sort of thing, but we actually diverged into looking at how films are created and how they're put together, visual imagery, whatever, editing, sound, music, all these sort of elements. If you start sitting back and saying, I'm not going to worry too much about what is being sold here or presented, I'll look at it, how it's being presented and that's when you look at all these elements and you understand why is it done that way? Why is it snappy editing on a car app? Why is it slow, luxurious editing and um, nice music when you're talking about toilet paper? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, they're different products that have to be sold in a different way. And you start going, hang on, okay, they're not just being, and this is the sophistication of the marketing, but it also has to be the sophistication of the audience, mm -hmm. um, that they can then take apart the ad. Oh, this is a, a female voice comforting. This is a male voice aggressive. This is, this is fast editing. This is loud music. It's exciting. This has got young people in the ad, so it's a product for young people. This has got older people in the ad, so it's an ad for funeral insurance. You know, it's it's all those sort of things that are... If you then take part advertising, you can then start applying that to other claims. Advertising's handy because they're often short and very accessible. And you can say, well, look at this, you know, look at the way it's presented. And then you start looking at the way the film, um, the classic story used to be films, you know, handheld camera versus a tripod camera. And you have a different purpose in filming different ways and you ask someone why do you use a handheld camera it's because you want to give a personal immediate effect as if you're really there and you're a shaky human being trying to film this thing a uh, tripod based camera is a more impersonal you can be drawn back you're just sort of observing 
And you start looking at all those techniques and the way digital media and print media, um, online media, whatever, are presented, you then start applying your critical thinking. And you can do that at age 13, 14, 15. You develop under Santa Claus some critical thinking to more subtle messaging, and you take it apart, and that really works. And people react to that, and they go, wow, I can see what you're saying, and I can see what they're doing it. And then they start doing it themselves. Right. You do it with one or two ads on TV, and then they start applying it to every ad on TV. And then you say, well, apply it to the news. Right? This is factual, in quotes, stuff. How is it being presented? You know, how, what colours do they use? What sort of uh, reports do they use? Why does every news reader, female news reader, have blonde hair? Yeah. So you can apply, I, I, I suppose we can call this the Santa Claus test. If a young <laughs> person expresses uh, disbelief in the ability of a uh, single old man to go around the world and give presents to everybody, <laughs> then at that stage you know that they've crossed a particular line that starting to question what's happening around them and the information they've been given and then they can use the same kind of thinking to assess other claims that are just as improbable. There are some skeptics who would regard any sort of fantasy, any sort of uh, you know, belief like Santa Claus as something you should not encourage anyone to believe or to mm. like. I'm not that belief. I would say most skeptics would say, by all means, have your fun, have your enjoyment but learn to differentiate between what is, you know, factual and yeah. what is fantasy. Yeah. Right? And I'm, I'm, I like my Lord of the Rings films as much as anybody, right? Yeah. But I don't regard that as being true or a documentary. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I wanted to ask you about that. Is, is too much scepticism uh, taking the fun out of life? No. Should we live a little bit of mystery aside and <laughs> enjoy? Can't help live mystery. I mean, science is about mystery. <laughs> That's what science, science is about, yeah, it's about yeah. discovery. It's about being wowed by, by the world. And I thinking, want to know how it works. How does that work? Yeah. yeah. Isn't that and amazing? Then there's, there's a lot of wow things out there. You're never going to run out. Uh, you're talking right? about quantum mechanics? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. String theory? That's a, that's a well, first of all, a wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not a physicist, right? I'm an English and history teacher, please. Well, you can see how I, I was, I'm just thinking when, whenever I hear quantum mechanics, it's a difficult concept even among scientists that actually study quantum mechanics and you can see how this particular topic has been taken by the quacks presenting yes. to the science and using the word quantum pretty much in anything you can think of and just taking advantage of people that don't really have a clue. Um, as I said, yeah. not even scientists in many cases understand those uh, advanced um, topics in science. Yeah, it's very true. I mean, sort of quantum, especially because um, quantum science and quantum physics and quantum mechanics is, uh, covers a lot of strange things which are counterintuitive. Hmm. And, I mean, you know, strange, not just in particles, strange particles, but actually the things that happen um, are, are hard to explain. Yes, just thinking... <laughs> And therefore, as, what, what did I say? That anyone who thinks they understand quantum mechanics is lying. Yes, <laughs> Richard Feynman. Um, yeah, it, it's, um, that's true. And therefore, because it's a mystery, because we know it's so strange, the people who use it in, in the sort of quackery take a very superficial approach to quantum and just saying it's strange so I can apply it to anything because no one really understands it. Hmm. Right? And, and it, it, it makes, and it just sounds sciencey, you know? You go, you're throwing a lot of science sounding words. You say, gee, that sounds factual. Yeah. No, just using a lot of words. But, I mean, it's, it's, it's a serious issue. If you're saying, is skeptics... I know skeptics who are very um, cut and dried, um, who, are, who refuse to accept they would ever be taken in by anything hmm. uh, and reckon that they critically assess everything in their lives. So I, I suppose a, a skeptic is like a detective... Where you try to way, uh, unravel, yeah, yeah. Uh, not a murder, but like a falsification of reality. Yeah, I mean, it's, well, it's a bit of detective, a bit of policing, a bit of science, a whole range of different areas. But it's it doesn't have to overwhelm every aspect of your life. Yeah. But you'll probably find that it actually does already most aspects of your life. But you still enjoy the Lord of the Rings, as you said, and I, I suppose you're a I still enjoy being in love with someone, you know. Yeah, exactly. And I don't know how that works. And you still like to buy a car, even though the specification says not what you... I've done, I've done it. I've done ca- it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Why do I not like particular... You are human after all. 
I'm human you, after you, all. In fact, most them. of us are. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> no, no, skeptics, skeptics are. They're human and they have their enjoyment. And I prefer a red wine to a white wine, and don't really know why. Uh, Tim, I wanted to ask you, like, to bring it back to teachers. Should teachers be skeptical of skepticism, or, <laughs> or <laughs> sh should they try to apply skeptical principles in their day-to-day? teaching and classes? And if yes, how would you recommend they do that? Yeah, well, let's not call it scepticism for a start. I mean, that, that's yep. a word that is pretty loaded. Um, sure. With climate skeptics and this sort of stuff, right? Um, people use the term scepticism in, in often in pejorative senses. Oh, yeah. So this is a person who's a party pooper, right? So let's use critical thinking as the term, and that's yep. probably the best. Skeptics have been trying to find another name for themselves ever since skepticism was around, yeah. okay? Because it does have critical a lot of, uh, thinkers, maybe? A lot of baggage. We can't think of one that yeah. works. But yeah, I mean, yeah, okay, let's take word. critical thinking. Critical thinking is should be, to me, the underpinning of everything you do in education. As I say, it's a process. And if you want to be skeptical of skepticism, that's fine as long as you apply that critical thinking to it. Right? Skeptics make claims and statements, and they should be assessed. In fact, skeptics are the most navel-gazing people you've ever met in your life. They're a pain. <laughs> they, sort of, they make a statement and they say, it's so worried about the way they've said it or you know, the definitiveness of what they've said. And you think, oh, for God's sake, just stop self-analyzing so much. But they do, right? Um, which I don't think a lot of the purveyors of pseudoscience do. But in, teach, in classes and education, yes. You don't have to be dismissive or cynical or everything. Let's just say critical thinking, which means looking at what the claim is, whether it's the advertising, what we discussed before, or whether it's a science class, you know, how do we know this is true? Now, you can't go around testing gravity in your local high school lab, you know, but maybe you can, you can drop a pen. And say, okay, it works. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, just there's a lot of stuff that you can't test, you have to take on, yeah. on, like on quantum mechanics. Advisor. Yeah, quite a bit. <laughs> oh, what about the double slit experiment? <laughs> you can do that, actually. Yeah, it's a coin. Yeah. There are certain things you can do, certain things you can't do, and certain things you shouldn't do, like you shouldn't set fire to the gas from the Bunsen burner. Yeah. But if, if, you can't, if you can't test something yourself in, a, let's say, a school environment, then what do you do? Well, you, there are certain things you have to take on faith. <laughs> That's a wrong word to use. <laughs> faith or perhaps things things you have to but... take on, on accepted understanding. And that's what science is. Uh, if, if, uh, if, if, if most people agree that this is probably likely to be true, you can work towards that. It doesn't mean it is, but I mean, it, it's a good starting point. But I mean, yes, you, you've got your textbooks and you've got your documentaries and you've got your videos or whatever. Um, but again, you have to sort of look at them, compare, compare sort of uh, uh, different explanations, and then sort of you can make up your own mind. There's a, the, some of those areas are, are very very touchy. Um, skeptics would be very, well, are very um, against any concept of teaching like creationism in science classes. Hmm. Why is that? Because creationism is, is, is classic uncritical thinking. It's actually based around I have a personal belief, which is a belief in God and that God created the world 6,000 years ago. And I'm now going to try and make the evidence fit my belief. So the problem there is not the message that comes out of creationism, is how they reach that um, the one outcome, aspect. right? And, and the then because is it is actually contradicts a lot of what we understand of the way it works, mm -hmm. and it's been built up over hundreds and hundreds of years of scientific endeavour, right? There is also an element there of teaching fantasy. Yeah. Now you can teach. I'm no problem teaching creationism in any religion, comparative religion classes, or even a social science mm -hmm. class. It fits in there, but it does not fit in the scientific method and science classes. Yeah, and that's because the the criteria for for the teaching of creationism are not scientific. So they reached a conclusion that I suppose the world is something like four or 5,000 years old, not so much based on geological evidence, for example, in scientific process, but uh, based on some other information that was given somehow. Uh, and that's what we're going to paranormal, right? I suppose that's what the objection is at this uh, distinction between what's scientific and what is not scientific. I mean, in scientific, it's about assessing and critical thinking and taking a claim apart and uh, just seeing what the evidence is. Now, with um, you go to any sort of talk to a creationist, and we have been doing talking to creationists ever since the skeptics were around, um, and you ask them, what is the reason, what, what's the basis for this? And half the time it comes down to God did it. Mm -hmm. And it stops there. And it sort of just goes straight. You know, if in doubt, if there's a problem with... Um, 
the evidence of the claims, it instantly goes back to this sort of um, primary cause that that guy did it. Now, the fact that they start off with that belief as a, a given, as a, a, a fact, in quotes, set in concrete, that God was there and God created the w world and will then try and make everything else fit that belief is going about it the wrong way. Yes, you can have a, a hypothesis. You can, yes, you can have a, an inkling of the way something should work. But if you go in there and do the scientific evidence, you do the experimentation, the research and the your peer review, etc., and you find that it's just not working out, therefore you have to drop it. Right, yeah. And with the, scientifically, with the claims that are made for creationism, I'm not to touch a religious side of it, that's, that's theirs. But scientifically, the claims that are made, they don't hold water. So in a nutshell, Tim, uh, what is creationism? Creationism is, uh, is, is a proper term for something which is also called intelligent design. Yep. That there is an external um, intelligent uh, force, God, if you like, mm -hmm. uh, which is real uh, and which influences the, the world as it is and, in fact, it created the world as it is. Um, and fundamentalist, uh, you know, basic creationism says that that happened in about 4004 BC. Right. 6,000 years. Some people say 10,000 years. And it has to do with the uh, way that life appeared on Earth, in yeah, that the yeah. life was actually designed instead of evolved. The thing is, creationism has been there for a long time, yeah, hundreds, mm. and hundreds of years. So the way it's not very scientifically expressed, but the belief that, you know, the fundamental belief that God created the world in six days, literal, trans, uh, literal interpretation of the Bible. People like Darwin, his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, people like that, a lot of people who were then starting to question that because they were looking at the evidence that was being developed at the time, fossil evidence, geological evidence, biological evidence, all sorts of things, um, and saying, well, this, there's a problem with this theory that the Earth was created in six days and you know, so many thousand years ago. And therefore, suddenly, the uh, fundamentalists had to fundamentalist Christians especially, but it's also Islamic and a whole lot of other religions have their own creation myths as well, hmm. suddenly had to do battle on the scientific arena rather than on the purely faith-based right. arena. Right, because the scientific arena, I suppose, started getting into their domain, right? Absolutely. And uh, Absolutely. disturbing the way that they thought the world was yeah. and had been built. I mean, if you, if you read um, Origin of Species, Darwin's book, it's a fabulous book to read, but you can see the man struggling yeah, the things he's yes. <laughs> he's trying to understand, and there's a few things there he doesn't know what the mechanism is, but he thinks there's something there, and you think, oh, you just got to think gene theory, gene theory, you know, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. he'd be fine. He would have answered some of his 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 nagging gaps in his knowledge. It was sort of suggestion also that there is no God to direct what we do, so it's a bit haphazard, it's a bit of, yeah, life is a bit of a pain. But in those sort of areas that suddenly the creationists trying to do battle on a scientific ground had to, because they started off with this basic belief that the world was created in six days, etc., at a certain time, everything had to be manipulated to fit that theory. If they dropped the theory and they just looked at the evidence, they would end up doing exactly what scientists are doing. And there's some very serious scientists who are working on the side of creationism here, um, in Australia, we've had geologists and physicists and various people who espouse creationist philosophy. Actually, interestingly, some of them espouse creationist philosophy in a creationist meeting, but in their science community, they won't even mention it. But uh, Australia's been very good at exporting creationists <laughs> to the well, world. Well, know that. Yeah, some of the leading ones in the US are actually Australian. Oh, wow. is we import anti-vax people. Yeah, well, that's a whole different story, I, I isn't think it? we lose on the deal. Yeah. <laughs> Or, uh, yeah, and anti-vaccination uh, propaganda is quite big, and I suppose that's where you really need a good critical mind. Absolutely, to, to absolutely. Basically, yeah. that's where it's a matter of life and death in many situations. That's, you'll ask most people, skeptics, what's the biggest issue they're dealing with, and anti-vaccination would probably yeah, be one, one mm. or two. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and that's when it gets very, very serious and angry. Um, do you think that you know, a deep understanding of science, starting from a young age, eventually makes us better people? And, and I know to include ethics in there as well, because it's uh, often a, a problem uh, that is expressed by a lot of people that uh, ethics is not properly covered in the STEM curriculum. Scientific knowledge is increasing, obviously, all the time, exponentially, every day, every minute. Um, and that's what a part of the complexity of trying to cope with all this overflow of uh, this of the information that you need to know half the time. Of course, if you don't need to know the things you do need to know. If you're teaching 
method, science method, ethics comes in there. Mm. Right? Because ethics is a, a, an approach for how you're doing something, for how you're making your decisions under what conditions. You either say, I'm going to cheat or I'm not going to cheat. Right? I'd approach people as um, intelligent human beings who have their own value uh, or I'm going to treat everybody like a, a dog. Right? But that's, yeah. that's just a, that's very personal ethics. There's the way you do things, the way you present data, the way you do your experimentation, the way you round up, you know, the people you deal with, all those sort of things. So if you're talking about scientific method rather than the mug and jug technique of just pouring information in, you, the, the, the critical thinking is about method, science is about method, ethics underpins in many areas that, is that method. And uh, I think it goes hand in hand. It's sort of part of the parcel. Right. But I always saw ethics as a way of distinguishing between what's right and what's wrong, especially in a social environment where you don't really live alone. You live uh, in a society and there are some expectations from everybody in terms of cooperation, safety, etc. And uh, studying ethics helps you understand uh, what is expected from a right versus wrong point of view. Yeah, the, yeah, the question then comes into moral judgment and sort of stuff and how flexible moral judgments against what a lot of people think of skeptics and science people that they do have moral judgments or they do have yeah. moral values. Um, it's it's not like you know, the world is a cold place where anything goes. It's like people totally misunderstand uh, the concept of survival of the fittest. Yeah. It's not survival of the strongest, it's survival of the best fit. Oh, the best one that fits in best. Yeah. Yeah, it's the jigsaw puzzle, not the hammer uh, approach. But, I mean, if, you, if you're teaching that there is a the way to achieve longevity in your research is through an ethical approach. If you cheat, you're going to be found out and your whole you know, your, your, your procedure, your research has gone down the drain. Even if you're necessarily wrong, if you approach it ethically... If you go down the wrong path, that's fine. That's what science is all about. A lot of wrong paths, very few correct ones. But if you approach it in the right manner, the right method, scientific methods, critical thinking method, whatever, your ethics are there in build. Yeah. And whether you want to understand it as a separate concept or you understand it as a, a contextual topic, that's fine. It's, it's again, these areas are things that actually skeptics deal with a lot. You get a whole next issue of the magazine, by the way, sneak mm -hmm. preview. Um, and that we're going to, there's a lot of argument there about philosophy great. and the importance of philosophy versus science. That's great. Yep. And actually that versus is a very misleading you know, term as these people are pointing out. I will link it in the show notes. Right. It's not that like, like there was science and not philosophy. There was, there was two things happening at the same time, and they deal with philosophy deals with ethics as much as science does. I will provide a link to the magazine from the show notes. It's also interesting that this came up in this conversation because in the, the previous guest, uh, Steve Stevens, said that the biggest challenge in STEM education today is really teaching kids ethics because there's so much power and potential in technology and science to not just do good in the world, but also to, good, to do damage. So mm. it makes sense to educate children uh, towards uh, what's the ethical use of all these capabilities into the future as well, more today than ever before. Yeah, I mean, it's, ethics is a hard one. It is about power. And, it's, and to try and teach moral right, etc., to someone who can see an advantage in cheating. Yeah. Now, there are advantages in cheating. There's obviously, it happens all the time in science. Unfortunately, there are people cheat, there are people sort of present data and no one bothers to check it, or that they fuck their data. And we can get on to uh, the anti vaccination people, if you like, <laughs> in yeah. this area. But I mean, it's, um, it's cheaters do prosper, unfortunately. Mm. Um, and, and it's a tough world out there, and they always have. But therefore, they, you've got to talk about to your, you, you talk to someone, I mean, trying to teach a moral argument to someone who, who is immoral, unmoral, yep. is, 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 is a losing cause. Mm. It's the old story of, um, you see the newspaper outrage to young hooligans bash up an old lady for her milk money. Oh, you know? Of course they're going to bash up an old lady. They don't fight back. Yeah. There's no moral argument here about how terrible it is to bash up an old person from the hooligan's point of view. Mm. They're the target. I mean, yeah, from everyone else's point of view, it's horrible you know, to hit on the defenseless, but that's the way the people that con people hit on. And we see it all the time with the sceptics and people taking advantage of, of people who are sort of... Uh, Vulnerable. Uh, stress, whatever. Hmm. So I'm afraid we're running out of time. So we're going to start firing some rapid-fire questions your way. Oh, God, okay. 
the first of which is, what is the skeptic's Bible? Uh, like the recommended, <laughs> recommended reading, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. the, uh, really I can give you a recommended reading, but no Bible. There's no Bible. Okay, outside of the Skeptic magazine that I edit, yep. plug, uh, some basic books that you want to get hold of, some of them are a bit old, actually. But probably I would go first to The uh, Dragon Haunted World by Carl Sagan. Yes, one of my favourite books. Yep, Flim Flam by James Randi. Yeah. Science, Good, Bad and Bugs by um, Martin Gardner. Bad Science by um, Ben Goldbecker. Yep. And especially go to a book called Trick or Treatment. Trick or Treatment, yeah. Trick or Treatment by um, Simon Singh and Edvard Ernst. Oh, yeah. Well, there's a great and, author's. Um, that's great on alternative medicine. That's the thing. That's a, that's a very good book because it actually gives a little chapter by chapter on a whole range of different treatments. And it's very easy to read. That's awesome. Any advice you'd like to give to teachers that would like to apply critical thinking in the class? Couch it in ordinary terms, as we've done here you know, in, this, in this discussion. Start off with looking at how you make decisions in your life and looking at you know, how you, do you use evidence or do you use emotion. Start off on that and then talk about how you can apply it to the particular subject you're looking at. And as I say, English literature is about assessment and critical thinking. History should be about history, about critical thinking more than just about facts. Maths is how to dissect a problem. Science is about how to dissect a particular situation. Uh, languages are how to sort of get into a language and understand how it works, right? Or doesn't work in some cases. But I mean, or every subject you can have in high school, music. You, you, you take it apart and you see how it works. Now, whether that's the clockmaker image or whether it's sort of just a, a, a loving, warm sort of embrace to discuss a particular topic, whatever, critical thinking applies to every subject in school. And it is a method which is vital that should be taught before you teach the facts. Mm-hmm. Yep, so that uh, students can understand the method as they follow it from one understand step to the, the other. Understand the method first. If, if, if you just mention the facts, all they're being taught is how to... Um, it becomes gospel, doesn't it? It's just uh, it does. hearsay. It's, yeah. it's mug and jug, which doesn't work for you. It doesn't have a long term value. Uh, yeah, it's not so much what you say, but how, how you got to it. And you teach critical thinking, and it can help save your life. Great. Um, just one last thing. Can teachers or are teachers welcome in a sceptical organisation like Skeptics of Australia? Oh, yes. And I know about uh, Skeptics in the pub as well. Can you tell us about what teachers can do if they want to you know, come to your meetings, uh, oh, talk to, to you, <laughs> call most you. Skeptics groups, most skeptic groups around the world have a, a social gathering. Yeah. And skeptics in the pub and that sort of thing. Basically, you just go to a meetup or look up skeptics in the pub and you'll find them all over the place. So there's about 19, I think, in Australia. There's hundreds all over the world. We've recently covered that in our magazine, actually, a lot of the different um, natures of getting together. Anybody is welcome. Paranormalists. Creationists are welcome to come to a skeptic in the pub meeting from our point of view, just so we can find out hmm. how to work together or how to discuss or what makes people tick. But I mean, yeah, there's a lot of IT people yeah. in, uh, in skeptics in the pub, certainly when I'm in Sydney, for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> why do you think that is? I've got no idea <laughs> whether IT is very heavily science based, maths based, and whether they see skepticism as the same. It I is, don't know. Uh, it is very evidence-based. The thing doesn't work. There's got to be a bug somewhere, and then you have to follow the trail reason. for the bug. Yeah. Yeah. Then again, I'm a humanities person, and I can never find a reason. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't talk about history, but we'll have to do that next time, I suppose, and cover that, because that's one question that I wanted to ask, actually. Uh, but it's okay. We're going to stop here, and then I would really like to have you back uh, in a while and talk a few other things that uh, popped into my mind now, uh, including history and uh, how to apply critical thinking in history and into the future as well to think, see where things are going and you know, we can talk about Bitcoin too I think it's in the news right now uh, but thank you very much for your time Tim I was really appreciated, it was a really interesting discussion I enjoyed it, thank you very much, thank you for the opportunity Our pleasure. Thank you. and we'll talk soon again That's all for this episode the notes for this episode that include links to many of the resources mentioned and information on how to get in touch with Tim are available on our website, texplore.com forward slash pay forward slash STEMiverse. Each episode comes with its own page on the Tech Explorations website and a goldmine of information in the notes. 
If you have any questions or suggestions for us, please send them to our email address pa at txplore.com and we'd be happy to answer them. Do you want us to interview someone in particular? Let us know. Visit us at txplore.com forward slash p forward slash stemiverse to get the show notes of every episode. Subscribe to us on iTunes by searching for the name of our podcast, Stemiverse. That's S-T-E-M-I-V-E-R-S-E. Thanks for listening and we'll see you again next time.